Relax and listen to the voice. Little Tiny or Thumbelina There once was a woman who wished very much to have a little child, but she could not obtain her wish. At last, she went to a fairy and said, I should so very much like to have a little child. Can you tell me where I can find one? Oh, that can easily be managed, said the fairy. Here is a barley corn of a different kind to those which grow in the farmer's market and farmer's fields, and which the chickens eat. Put it into a flower pot and see what will happen. Thank you, said the woman, and she gave the fairy twelve shillings, which was the price of the barley corn. Then she went home and planted it, and immediately there grew up a large and handsome flower, something like a tulip in appearance, but with its leaves tightly closed as if it were still a bud. It is a beautiful flower, said the woman, and she kissed the red and golden colored leaves, and while she did so, the flower opened, and she could see that it was a real tulip. Within the flower, upon the green velvet stems, sat a very delicate and graceful little maiden. She was scarcely half as long as a thumb, and they gave her the name of Thumbelina, or Tiny, because she was so small. A walnut shell, elegantly polished, served her for a cradle, her bed was formed of blue violet leaves with a rose leaf for a counterpane. Here she slept at night, but during the day she amused herself on a table where the woman had placed a plate full of water. Around this plate were wreaths of flowers with their stems in the water, and upon it floated a large tulip leaf which served Thumbelina for a boat. Here the little maiden sat and rowed herself from side to side with two oars made of white horsehair. It really was a very pretty sight. Thumbelina could also sing so softly and sweetly that nothing like her singing had ever been before heard. One night while she lay on her pretty bed, a large, ugly, wet toad crept through a broken pane of glass in the window and leapt right upon the table where Thumbelina lay sleeping under her rose leaf quilt. Mm, what a pretty little wife this would make for my son, said the toad, and she took up the walnut shell in which little Thumbelina lay asleep and jumped through the window with it back into the garden. In the swampy margin of a broad stream in the garden lived the toad with her son. He was uglier even than his mother, and when he saw the pretty little maiden in her elegant bed, he could only cry, don't speak so loud or she will wake, said the mother toad, and then she might run away, for she is as light as swans down. We will place her on one of the water lily leaves out in the stream. It will be like an island to her. She is so light and small, and then she cannot escape. And while she is away, we will make haste and prepare the stateroom under the marsh in which you are to live when you are married. Far out into the stream grew a number of water lilies with broad green leaves which seemed to float on top of the water. The largest of these leaves appeared further off than the rest, and the old toad swam out to it with the walnut shell in which little Thumbelina still lay sleeping. The tiny little creature woke very early in the morning and began to cry bitterly when she found where she was, for she could see nothing but water on every side of the large green leaf and no way of reaching the land. Meanwhile, the old toad was very busy underneath the marsh, decking her room with rushes and wild yellow flowers to make it look pretty for her new daughter-in-law. Then she swam out with her ugly son to the leaf on which she had placed poor little Thumbelina. She wanted to fetch the pretty bed that she might put it into the bridal chamber to be ready for her. 
the old toad bowed low to her in the water and said, Here is my son. He will be your husband, and you will live happily in the marsh by the stream. <coughs> was all her son could say for himself. So the toad took up the elegant little bed and swam away with it, leaving Thumbelina all alone on the green leaf where she sat and wept. She could not bear to think of living with the old toad and having her ugly son for a husband. The little fishes who swam about in the water beneath had seen the toad and heard what she said, so they lifted their heads above the water to look at the little maiden. As soon as they caught sight of her, they saw she was very pretty, and it made them very sorry to think that she must go and live with the ugly toads. No! It must never be. So they assembled together in the water, round the green stalk which held the leaf on which the little maiden stood, and nodded away at the root with their teeth. Then the leaf floated down the stream, carrying Thumbelina far away out of reach of land. Thumbelina sailed past many towns, and the little birds in the bushes saw her and sang, What a lovely little creature! So the leaf swam away with her farther and farther, till it brought her to other lands. A graceful little white butterfly constantly fluttered around her, and at last alighted on the leaf. Thumbelina pleased him, and she was glad of it, for now the toad could not possibly reach her, and the country through which she sailed was beautiful, and the sun shone upon the water, till it glittered like liquid gold. She took off her girdle, and tied one end of it round the butterfly, and the other end of the ribbon she fastened to the leaf, which now glided on much faster than ever, taking little Thumbelina with it as she stood. Presently, a large cockchafer flew by. The moment he caught sight of her, he seized her around the delicate waist with his claws, and flew with her into a tree. The green leaf floated away on the brook, and the butterfly flew with it, for he was fastened to it and could not get away. Oh, how frightened little Thumbelina felt when the cockchafer flew with her into the tree, but especially was she sorry for the beautiful white butterfly which she had fastened to the leaf, for if he could not free himself, he would die of hunger. But the cockchafer did not trouble himself at all about the matter. He seated himself by her side on a large green leaf, gave her some honey from the flowers to eat, and told her that she was very pretty, though not in the least like a cockchafer. After a time, all the cockchafers turned up their feelers and said, She has only got two legs. How ugly that looks. She has no feelers, said another. Her waist is quite slim. <laughs> She's like a human being. Oh, is she ugly, said all the lady cockchafers, although Thumbelina was actually very pretty. Then the cockchafer who had run away with her believed all the others when they said that she was ugly, and he would have nothing more to say to her, and told her she might go where she liked. Then he flew down with her from the tree, and placed her on a daisy, and she wept at the thought that she was so ugly that even the cockchafers would have nothing to say to her. And all the while, she was really the loveliest creature that one could imagine, and as tender and delicate as a beautiful rose leaf. During the whole summer, poor little Thumbelina lived quite alone in the wide forest. She wove herself a bed with blades of grass, and hung it up under a broad leaf to protect herself from the rain. She sucked the honey from the flowers for food, and drank the dew from their leaves every morning. So passed away the summer and the autumn, and then came the winter, the long, cold winter. All the birds who had sung to her so sweetly were flown away, and the trees and the flowers had withered. The large clover leaf under the shelter of which she had lived was now rolled together and shriveled up. Nothing remained but a yellow, withered stalk. She felt dreadfully cold, for her clothes were torn, and she was herself so frail and delicate that poor little Thumbelina was nearly frozen to death. It began to snow, too, and the snowflakes, as they fell upon her, 
were like a whole shovelful falling upon one of us, for we are tall, but she was only an inch high. Then she wrapped herself up in a dry leaf, but it cracked in the middle, and it could not keep her warm, and she shivered with cold. Near the wood in which she had been living lay a cornfield, but the corn had been cut a long time. Nothing remained but the bare dry stubble standing up out of the frozen ground. It was to her like struggling through a large wood would be for us. Oh, how she shivered with the cold. She came at last to the door of a field mouse who had a little den under the corn stubble. There dwelt the field mouse in warmth and comfort with a whole room full of corn, a kitchen, and a beautiful dining room. Poor little Thumbelina stood before the door, just like a little beggar girl, and begged for a small piece of barley corn, for she had been without a morsel to eat for at least two days. You poor little creature, said the field mouse, who was really a good old field mouse. Come into my room and dine with me. She was very pleased with Thumbelina, so she said, You are quite welcome to stay with me all winter if you like, but you must keep my rooms clean and neat and tell me stories, for I shall like to hear them very much. And tiny Thumbelina did all the field mouse asked of her, and found herself living very comfortably. We shall have a visitor soon, said the field mouse one day. My neighbor pays me a visit once a week. He is better off than I am. He has large rooms and wears a beautiful black velvet coat. If you could only have him for a husband, you would be well provided for indeed. But he is blind, so you must tell him some of your prettiest stories. But Tiny Thumbelina did not feel at all interested about this neighbor, for he was a mole. However, he came and paid his visit, dressed in his black velvet coat. He is very rich and learned, and his house is twenty times larger than mine said the field mouse. He was rich and learned, no doubt, but he always spoke slightingly of the sun and the pretty flowers because he had never seen them. Thumbelina was obliged to sing to him, Lady Bird, Lady Bird, Fly Away Home, and many other pretty songs. And the mole fell in love with her because she had such a sweet voice, but he said nothing yet, for he was very cautious. A short time before, the mole had dug a long passage under the earth, which led from the dwelling of the field mouse to his own, and here she had permission to walk with Thumbelina whenever she liked. But he warned them not to be alarmed at the sight of a dead bird which lay in the passage. It was a perfect bird, with a beak and feathers, and could not have been dead long, and it was lying just where the mole had made his passage. The mole took a piece of phosphorescent wood into his mouth, and it glittered like fire in the dark, and then he went before them to light them through the long, dark passage. When they came to the spot where lay the dead bird, the mole pushed his broad nose through the ceiling. The earth gave way, so that there was a large hole, and the daylight shone into the passage. In the middle of the floor lay a dead swallow, his beautiful wings pulled close to his sides, his feet and his head drawn up under his feathers, the poor bird had evidently died of the cold. It made Thumbelina very sad to see it. She did so love all the little birds, for all summer they had sung and twittered for her so beautifully. But the mole pushed it aside with his crooked legs and said, He will sing no more now. How miserable it must be to be born a little bird. I'm thankful that none of my children will ever be birds, for they can do nothing but cry. Tweet, 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 and always they die of hunger in the winter. Yes, you may well say that as a clever man, exclaimed the field mouse. 
What is the use of his twittering? For when winter comes, he must either starve or be frozen to death. Still, birds are a very high bred. Thumbelina said nothing, but when the two others had turned their backs on the bird, she stooped down and stripped aside the soft feathers which covered the head and kissed the closed eyelids. Perhaps this is the one who sang to me so sweetly in the summer, said she, and how much pleasure it gave me, you dear pretty bird. The mole now stopped up the hole through which the daylight shone, and then accompanied the lady home. But during the night, Thumbelina could not sleep, so she got out of bed and wove a large, beautiful carpet of hay, and then she carried it out to the dead bird and spread it over him with some down from the flowers which he had found in the field mouse's room. It was as soft as wool, and she spread some of it on each side of the bird, so that he might lie warmly in the cold earth. Farewell, you pretty little bird, said she. Farewell, thank you for your delightful singing during the summer, when all the trees were green and the warm sun shone upon us. Then she laid her head on the bird's breast, but she was alarmed immediately, for it seemed as if something inside the bird went thump, thump. It was the bird's heart. He was not really dead, only benumbed with the cold, and the warmth had restored him to life. In autumn, all the swallows fly away into the warm countries, but if one happens to linger, the cold seizes it, it becomes frozen, and falls down as if it were dead. It remains where it fell, and the cold snow covers it. Thumbelina trembled very much. She was quite frightened, for the bird was large, and a great deal larger than herself. She was only an inch high, but she took courage, laid the wool more thickly over the poor swallow, and then took a leaf which she had used for her own counterpane, and laid it over the head of the poor bird. The next morning she again stole out to see him. He was alive, but very weak. He could only open his eyes for a moment to look at Thumbelina, who stood by holding a piece of decayed wood in her hand, for she had no other lantern. Thank you, pretty little maiden, said the sick swallow. I have been so nicely warmed that I shall soon regain my strength and be able to fly about again in the warm sunshine. Oh, said she, it is cold out of doors now. It snows and freezes. Stay in your warm bed. I will take care of you. And then Thumbelina brought the swallow some water and a flower leaf, and after he had drank, he told her that he had wounded one of his wings in a thorn bush and could not fly as fast as the others, who were soon far away on their journey to warm countries. Then at last he had fallen to the earth, and could remember no more, nor how he came to be where she had found him. The whole winter the swallow remained underground, and tiny Thumbelina nursed him with care and love. Neither the mole nor the field mouse knew anything about it, for they did not like swallows. Very soon the springtime came, and the sun warmed the earth. Then the swallow bade farewell to Thumbelina, and she opened the hole in the ceiling which the mole had made. The sun shone in upon them so beautifully that the swallow asked her if she would go with him. She could sit on his back, he said, and he would fly away with her into the green woods. But Thumbelina knew it would make the field mouse very grieved if she left her in that manner, so she said, No, I cannot. Farewell, then. Farewell, you good pretty little maiden, said the swallow, and he flew out into the sunshine. Thumbelina looked after him, and the tears rose in her eyes. She was very fond of that poor swallow. Tweet, tweet, sang the bird as he flew out into the green woods, and Thumbelina felt very sad. She was not allowed to go out into the warm sunshine. The corn which had been sown in the fields over the house of the field mouse had grown up high into the air and formed a thick wood to tiny Thumbelina, who was only an inch in height. 
You are going to be married, Thumbelina, said the field mouse. My neighbor has asked for you. What good fortune for a poor child like you. Now we will prepare your wedding clothes. They must be both woolen and linen. Nothing must be wanting when you are the mole's wife. Thumbelina had to turn the spindle, and the field mouse hired four spiders who were to weave day and night. Every evening the mole visited her, and was continually speaking of the time when the summer would be over. Then he would keep his wedding day with Tiny, but now the heat of the sun was so great that it burned the earth, and it made it quite hard like a stone. As soon as the summer was over, the wedding should take place. But Thumbelina was not at all pleased, for she did not like the tiresome mole. Every morning when the sun rose, and every evening when it went down, she would creep out at the door, and as the wind blew aside the ears of corn so that she could see the blue sky, she thought how beautiful and bright it seemed out there, and wished so much to see her dear swallow again. But he never returned, for by this time he had flown far away into the lovely green forest. When autumn arrived, Thumbelina had her outfit quite ready, and the field mouse said to her, In four weeks the wedding must take place. Then tiny Thumbelina wept and said that she would not marry the disagreeable mole. Oh, nonsense, replied the field mouse. Now, don't be obstinate, or I shall quite bite you with my white teeth. He is a very handsome mole. The queen herself does not wear more beautiful velvets and furs. His kitchen and cellars are quite full. You ought to be very thankful for such good fortune. So the wedding day was fixed, on which the mole was to fetch Thumbelina away to live with him, deep under the earth, and never again to see the warm sun, because he did not like it. The poor child was very unhappy at the thought of saying farewell to the beautiful sun, and as the field mouse had given her permission to stand at the door, she went to look at it once more. Farewell, bright sun, she cried, stretching out her arm towards it, and then she walked a short distance from the house, for the corn had been cut, and only the dry stubble remained in the fields. Farewell, farewell, she repeated, twining her arm around a little red flower that grew just by her side. Quit the little swallow from me if you should see him again. Tweet, 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 tweet. She heard the sound over her head suddenly. She looked up, and there was the swallow himself flying close by. As soon as he spied tiny Thumbelina, he was delighted, and then she told him how unwilling she felt to marry the ugly mole and to live always beneath the earth and never to see the bright sun any more. And as she told him, she wept. Cold winter is coming, said the swallow, and I am going to fly away into warmer countries. Will you go with me? You can sit on my back and fasten yourself on with this sash, and then we can fly away from the ugly mole and his gloomy rooms, far away, over the mountains, into warmer countries, where the sun shines more brightly than here, where it's always summer, and the flowers bloom in greater beauty. Fly with me now, dear little Thumbelina. You saved my life when I lay frozen in that dark passage. Yes, I will go with you, said Thumbelina, and she seated herself on the bird's back, with her feet on his outstretched wings, and tied her girdle to one of his strongest feathers. Then the swallow rose into the air, and flew over forest and over sea, high above the highest mountains, covered with eternal snow. Thumbelina would have been frozen in the cold air, but she crept under the bird's warm feathers, keeping her little head uncovered so that she might admire the beautiful lands over which they passed. At length they reached the warm countries, where the sun shines brightly and the sky seems so much higher above the earth. 
Here, on the hedges and by the wayside, grew purple, green, and white grapes. Lemons and oranges hung from the trees in the woods, and the air was fragrant with myrtles and orange blossoms. Beautiful children ran along the country lanes, playing with large gay butterflies, and as the swallows flew further and further, every place appeared still more lovely. At last they came to a blue lake, and by the side of it, shaded by trees of the deepest green, stood a palace of dazzling white marble, built in the olden times. Vines clustered around its lofty pillars, and at the top were many swallows' nests, and one of these was the home of the swallow who carried Thumbelina. This is my house, said the swallow, but it would not do for you to live there. You would not be comfortable. You must choose for yourself one of the lovely flowers, and I will put you down upon it, and then you shall have everything that you can wish to make you happy. Oh, that will be delightful, she said, and she clapped her little hands with joy. A large marble pillar lay on the ground, which, in falling, had been broken into three pieces. Between these pieces grew the most beautiful large white flowers, so the swallow flew down with Thumbelina and placed her on one of the broad leaves. But how surprised she was to see in the middle of the flower a tiny little man, as white and transparent as if he had been made of crystal. He had a gold crown on his head and delicate wings at his shoulders and was not much larger than Thumbelina herself. He was an angel of the flower, for a tiny man and a tiny woman dwell in every flower, and this was the king of them all. Oh, how beautiful he is, whispered Thumbelina to the swallow. The little prince was at first quite frightened of the bird, who was like a giant compared to such a delicate little creature as himself. But when he saw tiny Thumbelina, he was delighted and thought her the prettiest little maiden that he had ever seen. He took the gold crown from his head and placed it directly on hers, asked her her name and if she would be his wife and queen over all of the flowers. This certainly was a very different sort of husband than the son of the toad or the mole with his black velvet fur. So she said yes to the handsome prince. Then all of the flowers opened, and out of each came a little lady or a tiny lord, all so pretty it was quite a pleasure to look at them. Each of them brought Thumbelina a present, but the best gift was a pair of beautiful wings which had belonged to a large white fly, and they fastened them to tiny Thumbelina's shoulders so that she might fly from flower to flower. Then there was much rejoicing, and the little swallow who sat above them in his nest was asked to sing a wedding song, which he did as well as he could, but in his heart he felt sad, for he was very fond of Thumbelina and would have liked to have never had to part from her again. You must not be called Thumbelina any more, said the spirit of the flowers to Thumbelina. It is an ugly name, and you are so very pretty. We will now call you Maya. Farewell, farewell, said the swallow with a heavy heart as he left the warm countries to fly back into Denmark. There he had a nest over the window of a house in which dwelt the writer of fairy tales. The swallow sang, Tweet, 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 and from his song, came the whole story. The Saucy Boy Once upon a time, there was an old poet, one of those right good old poets. One evening, as he was sitting at home, there was a terrible storm going on outside. The rain was pouring down, but the old poet sat comfortably in his chimney corner, where the fire was burning and the apples were roasting. There will not be a dry thread left on the poor people who are out in this weather, 
he said. Oh, open the door. I am so cold and wet through, called a little child's voice from outside. It was crying and knocking at the door whilst the rain was pouring down and the wind was rattling all the windows. Poor creature, said the poet, and he got up and opened the door. Before him stood a little boy. He was naked, and the water flowed from his long, fair locks. He was shivering with cold. If he had not been let in, he would have certainly perished in the storm. Oh, poor little thing, said the poet, and he took him by the hand. Come to me. I will soon warm you. You shall have some wine and an apple, for you are such a pretty boy. And he was, too. His eyes sparkled like two bright stars, and although the water flowed down from his fair locks, they still curled quite beautifully. He looked like a little angel, but he was pale with cold and trembling all over. In his hands he held a splendid bow, but it had been entirely spoiled by the rain, and the colors of the pretty arrows had run into one another by getting wet. The old man sat down by the fire, and taking the little boy on his knee, wrung the water out of his locks and warmed his hands in his own. He then made him some hot spiced wine, which seemed to quickly revive him, so that with reddening cheeks he sprang upon the floor and danced around the old man. You are a merry boy, said the latter. What is your name? My name is Cupid, he answered. Don't you know me? There likes my bow. I shoot with that, you know. Look, the weather is getting fine again. The moon is shining. But your bow is spoiled, said the old poet. That would be unfortunate, said the little boy, taking it up and looking at it. Oh, it's quite dry and it isn't damaged at all. The string is quite tight. I'll try it. So, drawing it back, he took an arrow, aimed, and shot the good old poet right in the heart. Do you see now that my bow was not spoilt? He said, and loudly laughing, ran away. What a naughty boy to shoot the old poet like that, who had given him into his warm room, had been so good to him, and had given him the nicest wine and the best apple. The good old man lay upon the floor crying. He was really shot in the heart. Oh, he cried, what a naughty boy this Cupid is. I shall tell all the good children about this, so that they take care never to play with him, lest he hurts them. And all the good children, both girls and boys, whom he told about this, were on their guard against wicked Cupid. But he deceives them all the same, for he is very deep. When the students come out of class, he walks beside them with a book under his arm and wearing a black coat. They cannot recognize him. And then, if they take him by the arm, believing him to be a student too, he sticks an arrow into their chest. And when the girls go to church to be confirmed, he is amongst them there too. In fact, he is always after people. He sits in the large chandelier in the theater and blazes away so that people think it is a lamp, but they soon find out their mistake. He walks about in the castle garden and on the promenades. Yes, once he shot your father and your mother in the heart too. Just ask them and you will hear what they will say. Oh, he is a bad boy this Cupid, and you must never have anything to do with him, for he is after everyone. Just think, he even shot an arrow at old grandmother, but that was a long time ago. The wound has long been healed, but such things are never forgotten. And now, you know what a bad boy this wicked Cupid is. The Traveling Companion Poor John was very sad, for his father was so ill. He had no hope of his recovery. John sat alone with the sick man in the little room, and the lamp had nearly burnt out, for it was late in the night. 
You have been a good son, John, said the sick father, and God will help you on in the world. He looked at him as he spoke, with mild, earnest eyes, drew a deep sigh, and died, yet it appeared as if he still slept. John wept bitterly. He had no one in the wide world now, neither father, mother, brother, nor sister. Poor John. He knelt down by the bed, kissed his dead father's hand, and wept many, many bitter tears. But at last his eyes closed, and he fell asleep with his head resting against the hard bedpost. Then he dreamed a strange dream. He thought he saw the sun shining upon him, and his father alive and well, and even heard him laughing as he used to do when he was very happy. A beautiful girl, with a golden crown on her head, and long shining hair, gave him her hand, and his father said, See what a bride you have won. She is the loveliest maiden on the whole earth. And then he awoke, and all the beautiful things vanished before his eyes. His father lay dead on the bed, and he was all alone. Poor John. During the following week, the dead man was buried. The son walked behind the coffin which contained his father, whom he so dearly loved and would never again behold. He heard the earth fall on the coffin lid and watched it till only a corner remained in sight, and at last that also disappeared. He felt as if his heart would break with its weight of sorrow, till those who stood round the grave sang a psalm, and the sweet, holy tones brought their tears into his eyes, which relieved him. The sun shone brightly down on the green trees, as if it would say, You must not be sorrowful, John. Do you see the beautiful sky above you? Your father is up there, and he prays to the loving father of all, that you may do well in the future. I will always be good, said John, and then I shall go to be with my father in heaven. What joy it will be when we see each other again! How much I shall have to relate to him, and how many things he will be able to explain to me of the delights of heaven, and teach me as he once did on earth. Oh, what joy it will be! He pictured it all so plainly to himself, that he smiled even while the tears ran down his cheeks. The little birds in the chestnut trees twittered, Tweet, tweet! They were so happy, although they had seen the funeral, but they seemed as if they knew that the dead man was now in heaven, and that he had wings much larger and more beautiful than their own, and he was happy now, because he had been good here on earth, and they were glad of it. John saw them fly away out of the green trees into the wide world, and he longed to fly with them, but first he cut out a large wooden cross to place on his father's grave, and when he brought it there in the evening, he found the grave decked out with gravel and flowers. Strangers had done this. They who had known the good old father who was now dead, and who had loved him very much. Early next morning, John packed up his little bundle of clothes and placed all of his money, which consisted of fifty dollars and a few shillings, into his girdle. With this, he determined to try his fortune in the world. But first he went into the churchyard, and by his father's grave he offered up a prayer and said farewell. As he passed through the fields, all the flowers looked fresh and beautiful in the warm sunshine, and nodded in the wind as if they wished to say, Welcome to the green wood, where all is fresh and bright. Then John turned to have one more look at the old church, in which he had been christened in his infancy, and where his father had taken him every Sunday to hear the service and join in singing the psalms. As he looked at the old tower, he espied the ringer standing at one of the narrow openings with his little pointed red cap on his head and shading his eyes from the sun with his bent arm. John nodded farewell to him, and the little ringer waved his red cap, laid his hand on his heart, and kissed his hand to him a great many times to show that he felt kindly towards him and wished him a prosperous journey. 
John continued his journey and thought of all the wonderful things he should see in the large, beautiful world until he found himself farther away from home than ever he had been before. He did not even know the names of the places he passed through and could scarcely understand the language of the people he met, for he was far away in a strange land. The first night he slept on a haystack out in the fields, for there was no other bed for him, but it seemed to him so nice and comfortable that even a king need not wish for better. The field, the brook, the haystack, with the blue sky above, formed a beautiful sleeping room. The green grass with the little red and white flowers was the carpet. The elder bushes and the hedges of wild roses looked like garlands on the walls, and for a bath he could have the clear, fresh water of the brook, while the rushes bowed their heads to him to wish him good morning and good evening. The moon, like a large lamp, hung high up in the blue ceiling, and he had no fear of its setting fire to his curtains. John slept here quite safely all night, and when he awoke, the sun was up, and all the little birds were singing around him. Good morning, good morning, are you not up yet? It was Sunday, and the bells were ringing for church. As the people went in, John followed them. He heard God's word, joined in singing the psalms, and listened to the preacher. It seemed to him just as if he were in his own church, where he had been christened and had sung the psalms with his father. Out in the churchyard were several graves, and on some of them the grass had grown very high. John thought of his own father's grave, which he knew at last would look like these, as he was not there to weed and attend to it. Then he set to work, pulled up the high grass, raised the wooden crosses which had fallen down, and replaced the wreaths which had been blown away from their places by the wind, thinking all of the time, Perhaps someone is doing the same for my father's grave, as I am not there to do it. Outside the church door stood an old beggar leaning on his crutch. John gave him his silver shillings, and then he continued his journey feeling lighter and happier than ever. Towards evening, the weather became very stormy, and he hastened on as quickly as he could to get to shelter, but it was quite dark by the time he reached a little lonely church which stood on a hill. I will go in there, he said, and sit down in a corner, for I am quite tired and want the rest. So he went in and seated himself, then he folded his hands and offered up his evening prayer, and was soon fast asleep and dreaming, while the thunder rolled and the lightning flashed without. When he awoke, it was still night, but the storm had ceased, and the moon shone in upon him through the windows. Then he saw an open coffin standing in the center of the church, which contained a dead man waiting for burial. John was not at all timid. He had a good conscience, and he knew also that the dead man can never injure anyone. It is living, wicked men who do harm to others. Two such wicked persons stood now by the dead man, who had been brought to the church to be buried. Their evil intentions were to throw the poor dead body outside the church door, and not leave him to rest in his coffin. Boy, why do you do this? asked John, when he saw what they were going to do. It is very wicked. Leave him to rest in peace, in Christ's name. Nonsense, replied one of the two dreadful men. He has cheated us. He owed us money which he could not pay, and now he is dead. We shall not get a penny. So we mean to have our revenge, and let him lie like a dog outside the church door. I have only fifty dollars, said John. It is all I possess in the world, but I will give it to you if you promise me faithfully to leave the dead man in peace. I shall be able to get on without the money. I have strong and healthy limbs, and God will always help me. Why, of course, said the horrid man. If you will pay his debt, we will both promise not to touch him. You may depend on that and they took the money that John offered them, laughed at him for his good nature, and then went on their way. 
Then John laid the dead body back into the coffin, folded the hands, and took leave of it, and went away contentedly through the great forest. All around him he could see the prettiest little elves dancing in the moonlight which shone through the trees. They were not disturbed by his appearance, for they knew he was good and harmless among men. They are wicked people only who can never obtain a glimpse of fairies. Some of them were not taller than the breadth of a finger, and they wore golden combs in their long yellow hair. They were rocking themselves two together on the large dewdrops with which the leaves and the high grass were sprinkled. Sometimes the dewdrops would roll away, and then they fell down between the stems of the long grass, and caused a great deal of laughing and noise among the other little people. It was quite charming to watch them at play. Then they sang songs, and John remembered that he had learned those pretty songs when he was just a little boy. Large speckled spiders, with silver crowns on their heads, were employed to spin suspension bridges and palaces from one hedge to another, and when the tiny drops fell upon them, they glittered in the moonlight like shining glass. This continued until sunrise. And then, the little elves crept into the flower buds, and the wind seized the bridges and palaces, and fluttered them in the air like cobwebs. As John left the wood, a strong man's voice called after him. Hello, comrade. Where are you traveling? Into the wide world, he replied. I am only a poor lad. I have neither father nor mother, but God will help me. I am going into the wide world also, replied the stranger. Shall we keep each other company? Oh, with all my heart, he said, and so they went on together. Soon they began to like each other very much, for they were both good, but John found out that the stranger was much more clever than himself. He had traveled all over the world and could describe almost everything. The sun was high in the heavens when they seated themselves under a large tree to eat their breakfast, and at the same moment an old woman came towards them. She was very old and almost bent double. She leaned upon a stick and carried on her back a bundle of firewood, which she had collected in the forest. Her apron was tied around it, and John saw three great stems of fern and some willow twigs peeping out. Just as she came close up to them, her foot slipped, and she fell to the ground, screaming loudly. That poor old woman! She had broken her leg! John proposed directly that they should carry the old woman home to her cottage, but the stranger opened his knapsack, and took out a box in which he said he had a salve that would quickly make her leg well and strong again, so that she would be able to walk home herself, as if her leg had never been broken. And all that he would ask in return was for the three fern stems that she carried in her apron. That is rather too high a price, said the old woman, nodding her head quite strangely. She did not seem inclined at all to part with the fern stems, however, it was not very agreeable to lie there with a broken leg, so she gave them to him, and such was the power of the ointment, that no sooner had he rubbed her leg with it than the old mother rose up and walked even better than she had done before. But then this wonderful ointment could not be bought at a chemist's. "'What can you want with these three fern rods?' asked John of his fellow traveler. "'Oh, they will make capital brooms!' said he, and I like them because I have strange whims sometimes. And then the two men walked on together for a long distance. Oh, how dark the sky is becoming, said John, and look at those thick, heavy clouds. Those are not clouds, replied his fellow traveler. They are mountains, large and lofty mountains, on the tops of which we should be above the clouds, in the pure free air. Believe me, it is delightful to ascend so high. Tomorrow we shall be there. But the mountains were not so near as they appeared. They had traveled a whole day before they reached them, and passed through black forests and piles of rock as large as a town. The journey had been so fatiguing that John and his fellow traveler 
stopped to rest at a roadside inn so that they might gain strength for their journey on the morrow. In the large public room of the inn, a great many persons were assembled to see a comedy performed by dolls. The showman had just erected his little theater, and the people were sitting round the room to witness the performance. Right in front, in the very best place, sat a stout butcher with a great bulldog by his side, who seemed very much inclined to bite. He sat staring with all his eyes, and so indeed did everyone else in the room. And then the play began. It was a pretty piece, with a king and a queen in it, who sat on a beautiful throne and had gold crowns on their heads. The trains to their dresses were very long, according to the fashion, while the prettiest of wooden dolls, with glass eyes and large mustaches, stood at the doors and opened and shut them, that the fresh air might come into the room. It was a very pleasant play, not at all mournful, but just as the queen stood up and walked across the stage, the great bulldog, who should have been held back by his master, made a spring forward and caught the queen in the teeth by the slender wrist, so that it snapped in two. This was a very dreadful disaster. The poor man, who was exhibiting the dolls, was much annoyed and quite sad about his queen. She was the prettiest doll he had had, and the bulldog had broken her head and shoulders off. But after all the people were gone away, the stranger who came with John said that he could set her to rights. And then he brought out his box and rubbed the doll with some of the salve which had cured the old woman when she broke her leg. As soon as this was done, the doll's back became quite right again. Her head and shoulders were fixed on, and she could even move her limbs herself. There was now no occasion to pull the wires, for the doll now acted just like a living creature excepting that she could not speak. The man to whom the show belonged was quite delighted at having a doll who could dance of herself without being pulled by the wires, none of which the other dolls could do. During the night, when all the people at the inn were gone to bed, someone was heard to sigh so deeply and painfully, and the sigh continued for a long time that everyone got up to see what could be the matter. The showman went at once to his little theater, and found that it proceeded from the dolls, who all lay on the floor, sighing piteously, and staring with their glass eyes. For they all wanted to be rubbed with the ointment, so that, like the queen, they might be able to move of themselves. The queen threw herself on her knees, took off her beautiful crown, and holding it in her hand, cried, Take this from me, but do rub my husband and his courtiers. The poor man who owned the theater could scarcely refrain from weeping. He was so sorry that he could not help them. Then he immediately spoke to John's comrade and promised him all the money he might receive at the next evening's performance if he would only rub the ointment on four or five of his dolls. But the fellow traveler said he did not require anything in return except in the sword which the showman wore by his side. As soon as he received the sword, he anointed six of the dolls with the ointment, and they were able immediately to dance so gracefully that all the living girls in the room could not help joining in the dance. The coachman danced with the cook, and the waiters with the chambermaids, and all the strangers joined. Even the tongs and the fire shovel made an attempt, but they fell down after the first jump. So after all, it was a very merry night. The next morning, John and his companion left the inn to continue their journey through the great pine forest and over the high mountains. They arrived at last at such a great height that towns and villages lay beneath them, and the church steeples looked like little specks between the green trees. They could see for miles round, far away to places they had never visited, and John saw more of the beautiful world than he had ever known before. The sun shone brightly in the blue firmament above, and through the clear mountain air came the sound of the huntsman's horn, and the soft, sweet notes brought tears into his eyes, and he could not help exclaiming, How good and loving God is to give us all this beauty and loveliness in the world to make us happy! 
His fellow traveler stood by with folded hands, gazing on the dark wood and the towns bathed in the warm sunshine. At this moment, there sounded over their heads sweet music. They looked up and discovered a large white swan hovering in the air and singing as never a bird had sang before. But the song soon became weaker and weaker. The bird's head dropped, and he sunk slowly down and lay dead at their feet. It is a beautiful bird, said the traveler, and these large white wings are worth a great deal of money. I will take them with me. You see now that a sword would be very useful. So we cut off the wings of the dead swan with one blow and carried them away with him. They now continued their journey over the mountains for many miles till they at length reached a large city containing hundreds of towers that shone in the sunshine like silver. In the midst of the city stood a splendid marble palace, roofed with pure red gold, in which dwelt the king. John and his companion would not go into the town immediately, so they stopped at the inn outside the town to change their clothes, for they wished to appear respectable as they walked through the streets. The landlord of the inn told them that the king was a very good man, who never injured anyone, but as to his daughter, Heaven defend us! She was indeed a wicked princess. She possessed beauty enough. Nobody could be more elegant or prettier than she was. But what of that? For she was a wicked witch, and in consequence of her conduct, many noble young princes had lost their lives. Anyone was at liberty to make her an offer, were he a prince or a beggar, it mattered not to her. She would ask him to guess three things which she had just thought of, and if he succeeded, he was to marry her and be king over all the land when her father died. But if he could not guess these three things, then she ordered him to be hanged or to have his head cut off. The old king, her father, was very much grieved at her conduct, but he could not prevent her from being so wicked, because he once said he would have nothing more to do with her lovers she might do as she pleased. Each prince who came and tried the three guesses, so that they might marry the princess, had been unable to find them out, and had been hanged or beheaded. They had all been warned in time, and might have left her alone if they would. The old king became at last so distressed at all these dreadful circumstances, that for a whole day every year, he and his soldiers knelt and prayed that the princess might become good, but she continued on as wicked as ever. The old woman who drank brandy would color it quite black before they drank it, to show how they mourned, and what more could they do? What a horrible princess, said John. She ought to be well flogged. If I were the old king, I would have her punished in some way. Just then, they heard the people outside shouting, Hurrah! Hurrah! And looking out, they saw the princess passing by, and she really was so beautiful that everybody forgot her wickedness and shouted, Hurrah! Hurrah! Twelve lovely maidens in white silk dresses, holding golden tulips in their hands, rode by her side on coal-black horses. The princess herself had a snow-white steed, decked with diamonds and rubies. Her dress was of cloth of gold, and the whip she held in her hand looked like a sunbeam. The golden crown on her head glittered like the stars of heaven, and her mantle was formed of thousands of butterflies' wings sewn together. Yet she herself was more beautiful than all. When John saw her, his face became as red as a drop of blood, and he could scarcely utter a word. The princess looked exactly like the beautiful lady with the golden crown, of whom he had dreamed on the night his father died. She appeared to him so lovely that he could not help loving her. It could not be true, he thought, that she was really a wicked witch who ordered people to be hanged or beheaded if they could not guess her thoughts. Everyone has permission to go and ask her hand, even the poorest beggar. I think I shall pay a visit to the palace. 
He then said out loud, I must go, for I cannot help myself. Then they all advised him not to attempt it, for he would be sure to share the same fate as the rest. His fellow traveler also tried to persuade him against it, but John seemed quite sure of success. He brushed his shoes and his coat, washed his face and his hands, combed his soft flaxen hair, and then went out alone into the town and walked to the palace. Do come in, said the king, as John knocked at the door. John opened it, and the old king, in a dressing gown and embroidered slippers, came towards him. He had the crown on his head, carried his scepter in one hand and the orb in the other. Wait just a bit, said he, and he placed the orb under his arm so that he could offer the other hand to John. But when he found that John was another suitor, he began to weep so violently that both the scepter and the orb fell to the floor, and he was obliged to wipe his eyes with his dressing gown. Poor old king. Let her alone, he said. You will fare as badly as the others. Come, I will show you. Then he led him out into the princess's pleasure gardens, and there he saw a frightful sight. On every tree hung three or four king's sons who had wooed the princess, but had not been able to guess the riddles that she gave to them. Their skeletons rattled in every breeze, so that the terrified birds never dared to venture in the garden. All the flowers were supported by human bones instead of sticks, and human skulls in the flower pots grinned horribly. It was really a doleful garden for a princess. Do you see all of this? said the old king. Your fate will be the same as those who are here. Therefore, do not attempt it. You really make me very unhappy. I take these things to heart so much, so very much. John kissed the good old king's hand and said that he was sure it would be all right, for he was quite enchanted with the beautiful princess. Then the princess herself came riding into the palace yard with all of her ladies, and he wished her good morning. She looked wonderfully fair and lovely when she offered her hand to John, and he loved her now more than ever. How could she be a wicked witch, as all the people asserted? He accompanied her into the hall, and the little pages offered them gingerbread nuts and sweetmeats, but the old king was so unhappy he could eat nothing, and besides, Gingerbread nuts were too hard for him. It was decided that John should come to the palace the next day, when the judges and the whole of the counselors would be present, to try if he could guess the first riddle. If he succeeded, he would have to come a second time, but if not, he would lose his life. And no one had ever been able to guess even one. However, John was not at all anxious about the results of his trial. On the contrary, he was very merry. He thought only of the beautiful princess and believed that in some way he should have help, but how he knew not and did not like to think about it, so he danced along the high road as he went back to the inn where he had left his fellow traveler waiting for him. John could not refrain from telling him how gracious the princess had been and how beautiful she looked. He longed for the next day so much that he might go to the palace and try his luck at guessing the riddles. But his comrade shook his head and looked very mournful. I do so wish you to do well, said he. We might have continued together much longer, and now I am likely to lose you, you poor dear John. I could shed tears, but I will not make you unhappy on the last night that we may have together. We will be merry, really merry this evening. And tomorrow, after you are gone, I hope that I shall be able to weep undisturbed. It was very quickly known among the inhabitants of the town that another suitor had arrived for the princess, and there was a great sorrow in consequence. The theater remained closed, the women who sold sweetmeats tied crepe around their sugar sticks, and the king and the priest were on their knees in the church. There was a great lamentation, for no one expected John to succeed, 
better than those who had attempted to be suitors before. In the evening, John's comrade prepared a large bowl of punch and said, Now, let us be merry and drink to the health of the princess. But after drinking two glasses, John became so sleepy that he could not keep his eyes open, and he fell fast asleep. Then his fellow traveler lifted him gently out of his chair and laid him down on the bed, and as soon as it was quite dark, he took the two large wings which he had cut from the dead swan and tied them firmly to his own shoulders. Then he put into his pocket the largest of the three rods which he had obtained from the old woman who had fallen and broken her leg. After this, he opened the window and flew away over the town, straight towards the palace, and seated himself in a corner under the window which looked into the bedroom of the princess. The town was perfectly still when the clock struck a quarter to twelve. Presently the window opened, and the princess, who had large black wings on her shoulders and a long white mantle, flew away over the city towards a high mountain. The fellow traveler who had made himself invisible so that she could not possibly see him flew after her through the air and whipped the princess with his rod so that the blood came whenever he struck her. Ah! It was a strange flight through the air. The wind caught her mantle so that it spread out on all sides like the large sail of a ship, and the moon shone through it. How it hails to be sure, said the princess at each blow she received from the rod, and it served her right to be whipped. At last she reached the side of the mountain and knocked. The mountain opened up with a noise like the roll of thunder, and the princess went in. The traveler followed her. No one could see him as he had made himself invisible. They went through a long, wide passage. A thousand gleaming spiders ran here and there on the walls, causing them to glitter as if they were illuminated with fire. They next entered a large hall built of silver and gold. Large red and blue flowers shone on the walls, looking like sunflowers in size, but no one could dare to pluck them for the stems were hideous poisonous snakes, and the flowers were flames of fire, darting out of their jaws. Shining glowworms covered the ceiling, and sky-blue bats flapped their transparent wings. Altogether, the place had a frightful appearance. In the middle of the floor stood a throne supported by four skeleton horses, whose harnesses had been made by fiery red spiders. The throne itself was made of milk-white glass, and the cushions were little black mice, each biting the other's tail. Over this hung a canopy of rose-colored spiderwebs, spotted with the prettiest little green flies, which sparkled like precious stones. On the throne sat an old magician with a crown on his ugly head and a scepter in his hand. He kissed the princess on the forehead, seated her by his side on the splendid throne, and then the music commenced. Great black grasshoppers played the mouth organ, and the owl struck herself on the body instead of a drum. It was altogether a ridiculous concert. Little black goblins with false lights in their caps danced about the hall, but no one could see the traveler, and he had placed himself just behind the throne where he could see and hear everything. The courtiers who came in afterwards looked noble and grand, but anyone with common sense could see what they really were. Only broomsticks with cabbages for heads. The magician had given them life and dressed them in embroidered robes. It all answered very well, as they were only wanted for show. After there had been a little dancing, the princess told the magician that she had a new suitor and asked him what she could think of for the suitor to guess when he came to the castle the next morning. Listen to what I say, said the magician. You must choose something very easy. He is less likely to guess it then. Think of one of your shoes. He will never imagine that that is it. Then cut his head off. And mind you, do not forget to bring his eyes with you tomorrow night so that I may eat them. The princess curtsied low and said that she would not forget the eyes. Then the magician opened the mountain, and she flew home again, 
But the traveler followed and flogged her so much with the rod that she sighed quite deeply about the heavy hailstorm and made as much haste as she could to get back to her bedroom through the window. The traveler then returned to the inn where John still slept, took off his wings and lay down on the bed, for he was very tired. Early in the morning, John awoke, and when his fellow traveler got up, he said that he had had a very wonderful dream about the princess and her shoe. He therefore advised John to ask her if she had not thought of her shoe. Of course, the traveler knew this from what the magician in the mountain had said. I may as well say that as anything, said John. Perhaps your dream may come true. Still, I say farewell, for if I guess wrong, I shall never see you again. Then they embraced each other, and John went into the town and walked to the palace. The great hall was full of people, and the judges sat in armchairs with eider-down cushions to rest their heads upon, because they had so much to think of. The old king stood near, wiping his eyes with his white pocket handkerchief. When the princess entered, she looked even more beautiful than she had appeared the day before, and greeted everyone present most gracefully, but to John she gave her hand and said, Good morning to you. Now came the time for John to guess what she was thinking of, and oh, how kindly she looked at him as he spoke. But when he uttered the single word, shoe, she turned as pale as a ghost. All of her wisdom could not help her, for he had somehow guessed rightly. Oh, how pleased the old king was. It was quite amusing to see how he capered about. All the people clapped their hands, both on his account and John's, who had guessed rightly the first time. His fellow traveler was glad also when he heard how successful John had been. But John folded his hands and thanked God, who he felt quite sure would help him again, and he knew that he had to guess twice more. The evening passed pleasantly like the one preceding. While John slept, his companion flew behind the princess to the mountain and flogged her even harder than before, and this time he had taken two rods with him. No one saw him go in with her, and he heard all that was said. The princess this time was to think of a glove, and he told John as if he had again heard it all in a dream. The next day, therefore, he was able to guess correctly the second time, and it caused great rejoicing at the palace. The whole court jumped about as they had seen the king do the day before, but the princess lay on the sofa and would not say a single word. All now depended upon John. If he only guessed rightly the third time, he would marry the princess and reign over the kingdom after the death of the old king. But if he failed, he would lose his life, and the magician would have his beautiful blue eyes. That evening John said his prayers and went to bed very early, and soon fell asleep calmly. But his companion tied on his wings to his shoulders, took three rods, and with his sword at his side, flew to the palace. It was a very dark night, and so stormy that the tiles flew from the roofs of the houses, and the trees in the garden upon which the skeletons hung bent themselves like reeds before the wind. The lightning flashed, and the thunder rolled in one long, continued peal all night. The window of the castle opened, and the princess flew out. She was pale as death, but she laughed at the storm as if it were not bad enough. Her white mantle fluttered in the wind like a large sail, and the traveler flogged her with all three rods till the blood trickled down, and at last she could scarcely fly. She contrived, however, to reach the mountain. What a hailstorm! she said as she entered. I, I have never been out in such weather as this. Yes, there may be too much of a good thing sometimes said the magician. Then the princess told him that John had guessed rightly the second time, and if he succeeded the next morning, he would win, and she could never come to the mountain again, or practice magic as she had done, and therefore she was quite unhappy. 
I will find out something for you to think of, which he will never guess, unless he is a greater conjurer than myself. But for now, let us be merry. Then the magician took the princess by both hands, and they danced with all the little goblins and jack-o'-lanterns in the room. The red spider sprang here and there on the walls quite as merrily, and the flowers of fire appeared as if they were throwing out sparks. The owl beat the drum, the crickets whistled, and the grasshoppers played the mouth organ. It was a very ridiculous ball. After they had danced enough, the princess was obliged to go home, for fear that she should be missed at the palace. The magician offered to go with her, that they might be company to each other on the way and then they flew away through the bad weather, and the traveler followed them, and broke his three rods across their shoulders. The magician had never been out in such a hailstorm as this. Just by the palace, the magician stopped to wish the princess farewell, and to whisper in her ear, Tomorrow, think of my head. But the traveler heard what he had whispered, and just as the princess slipped through the window into her bedroom, and the magician turned round to fly back to the mountain, he seized the magician by the long black beard, and with his saber cut off the wicked conjurer's head just behind the shoulders, so that he could not even see who it was. He threw the body into the sea of the fishes, and after dipping the head into the water, he tied it up in a silk handkerchief, took it with him to the inn, and then went to bed. The next morning, he gave John the handkerchief, and told him not to untie it until the princess asked him what she was thinking of. There were so many people in the great hall of the palace that they stood as thick as radishes tied together in a bundle. The council sat in their armchairs with the white cushions. The old king wore new robes and a golden crown, and his scepter had been polished up so that he looked quite smart. But the princess was very pale and wore a black dress as if she were going to a funeral. What have I thought of? asked the princess of John. He immediately pulled out the handkerchief and untied it, and was himself quite frightened when he saw the head of the ugly magician. Everyone in the parlor shuddered, for it was so terrible to look at, but the princess sat like a statue and could not utter a single word. At length, she rose and gave John her hand, for he had guessed rightly. She looked at no one, but sighed deeply and said, You are my master now. This evening our marriage must take place. I am very pleased to hear it, said the old king. It is just what I wish. And then all the people shouted, Hurrah! 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 The band played music in the streets, the bells rang, and the cake woman took the black crepe off of their sugar sticks. There was universal joy. Three oxen, stuffed with ducks and chickens, were roasted whole in the marketplace, where everyone might help himself to a slice. The fountain spouted forth the most delicious wine, and whoever bought a penny loaf at the baker's received six large buns, full of raisins, as a present. In the evening, the whole town was illuminated. The soldiers fired off cannons, and the boys let off crackers. There was eating and drinking, and dancing and jumping everywhere. In the palace, the high-born gentlemen and beautiful ladies danced with each other, and they could be heard at a great distance singing the following song. Here are maidens young and fair, dancing in the summer air. Like two spinning wheels at play, pretty maidens dance away. Dance the spring and summer through, till the soles fall from your shoe. But the princess was still a witch, and she could not love John. His fellow traveler had thought of that, so he gave John three feathers out of the swan's wings, and a little bottle with a few drops on it. He told John to place a large bath full of water by the princess's bed, and put the feathers and the drops into it. Then, at the moment she was about to go to bed, he must give her a little push, so that she might fall into the water, and then dip her into it three times. 
This would destroy the power of the magician, and she would love him very much. John did all that his companion told him to do. The princess shrieked aloud when he dipped her under the water the first time, and struggled under his hands in the form of a great black swan with fiery eyes. As she rose the second time from the water, the swan had become white, with a black ring round its neck. John allowed the water to close once more over the great bird, and at the same time, it changed into a most beautiful princess. She was more lovely even now than before, and she thanked him while her eyes sparkled with tears for having broken the spell of the magician. The next day, the king came with the whole court to offer their congratulations and stayed till quite late. Last of all came the traveling companion. He had a staff in his hand and his knapsack on his back. John kissed him many times and told him that he must not go. He must remain with him, for he was the cause of all his good fortune. But the traveler just shook his head and said gently and kindly, No, my time is up now. I have only paid my debt to you. Do you remember the dead man whom the bad people wished to throw out of his coffin? You gave all that you possessed that he might rest in his grave. I am that man. And as he said this, he vanished. The wedding festivities lasted a whole month. John and his princess loved each other dearly, and the old king lived to see many a happy day when he took their little children on his knees and let them play with his scepter. And John became king over the whole country. The End Short and sweet for this ending. Thank you all for being here for this episode. Take care of yourselves. Revel in the fantasy and the magic of the world. Rest well and have sweet dreams.